The world can be a cruel, chaotic, and often confusing place. There are wars, student loan companies, and antibiotic-resistant bacteria, pirates, shin-level surfaces, and brain-eating amoeba. Did you know that there are at least 132 species of venomous snakes? Mad shit. And if that wasn't bad enough, the whole place is getting warmer. No, in a bad way. How dare you! But luckily, there's a place we can all go to escape this hopeless, snake-filled hellscape we call the modern world. Bed. Welcome to Ordinary Things, where ordinary things are explained. Today we'll be exploring the history of the humble sleep square, so pour yourself a mug of chamomile tea, turn on your air purifier, and pick your favourite 10-hour ambient mix of the Blade Runner soundtrack, because it's time to get into beds. But what are beds? Beds are an item of furniture designed to facilitate sleep, relaxation, and sweaty depression spirals. It is estimated that we spend around one third of our lives in bed, which is approximately 230,000 hours. Our beds are the way station to our dreams, a place of intimacy, security, and the best place to get uninterrupted views of the ceiling. Most of us are born and conceived in bed, and most of us will die there, if we're lucky. And if we're really lucky, we'll be surrounded by loved ones and stoned to high heaven on hospital-grade morphine. But where did beds come from? Throughout history, humans have spent their days distracted by a variety of activities. But when the sun goes down, all humans are fervent horizontalists, and our nocturnal history has been devoted to the art of getting all snugly. In the Neolithic period, humans went from sleeping on the ground to sleeping on piles of leaves covered with animal pelts. The ancient Egyptians, always enthusiastic about piling shit on top of other shit, were among the first recorded civilizations to sleep on raised bed-like platforms. And the Roman Empire, partial to sacking cities, also slept on sacks, usually filled with reeds, wool, or hay. It really wasn't until the Middle Ages that something that we might recognise as a bed came into existence. But medieval beds were a serious investment, separating society into the have-nots and the have-cots. Owning a bed in the 15th century was a sure sign of status, so much so that the rich decorated them with things like curtains and canopies. Aristocrats even travelled with their beds, or more accurately, forced their servants to travel with them. It wasn't until the 16th century that more ordinary families could afford beds, along with other luxuries like second floors on their homes or living beyond their teens. But beds were still likely to be the most expensive item in a family home, as one would set a skilled craftsman back about three months' wages. This is the Great Bed of Ware, also known as Beddy Big Bollocks. Constructed in 1590 by Jonas Fosbrook, it measured 10 by 11 feet and was originally housed in the White Hart Inn in Ware, England. Where? Where The Great Bed of Ware was something of a celebrity at the time, and it even gets a mention in Shakespeare's second shittest play, Twelfth Night. It was said to comfortably accommodate four couples at a time, and it was recorded that one night in the 1680s up to 26 couples shared the god-sized mattress. But this mass lion was only slightly out of the ordinary, as beds have not always been the private palaces of solitary meditation and shameful self-abuse that we know them as today. In fact, most of human history was one long, inescapable sleepover. It was normal for entire families to share a single bed, often accompanied by house guests and servants. And it was normal for strangers to share beds while travelling. The only time you were likely to have a bed to yourself was when you were dying in it, as privacy in the bedroom, or anywhere really, is a relatively recent phenomenon. The Victorians are famous for their many hang-ups around sex and hygiene, but one that we might be thankful for is their insistence on separate sleeping arrangements. The Victorians slapped down a game-changing Uno reverse card when it came to human sleeping habits, as it only took a few uptight generations for us to go from sleeping in an incest-friendly tangle of limbs to sleeping all on our own. However, as with creative facial hair and ruling India with an iron fist, the Victorians had a habit of getting a little carried away and as such, they even believed that a married couple sharing a bed was unseemly or unhygienic. As such, the twin marital bed was an established norm among the British middle classes well into the mid-20th century. For most of the 19th century, though, mattresses continued to be as lumpy and unappealing as your mum, at least until someone had the bright idea of adding dozens of sharp, coiled pieces of iron to their basic structure. The first spring mattress was invented in 1865, but it wasn't until 1899 that a man named James Marshall invented the pocket spring mattress, and with it, changed the way we slept forever. James Marshall basically perfected the bed, and most mattresses today still incorporate some form of his bouncy brainchild. But that doesn't mean that bed-based innovation is over. In fact, the 20th century is filled with inventors trying to fix what wasn't broken, as there are now more kinds of bed than there are countable dream sheep. There are low beds, high beds, and really high beds. Beds that fold into walls, into sofas, and beds that fold onto you. I'll be sorry to go. 
sunbeds, frequently annexed by towel-wielding Germans, and beds filled with air, or your breath, if you're determined. There's race car beds and racist beds, beds for babies, beds for dogs, and beds for vibrating perverts. And then there's the patented bungee cord firework ceiling launcher bed. God, I love Japan. Every human being on the planet needs a place to lose consciousness at night, so there is a great incentive for innovators to come up with the next big thing in sleepy time comfort. And no one tried harder than the people in this informational feature from 1959, which concerns the bed of the future. And it also contains some pretty suggestive marketing for its time. See if you can tell what I mean. The ingenuity of bed designers is our subject, and this particular example underlines the fact that we are living in a highly mechanized age. Just the thing after a hard day slaving over a hot and fully automatic oven. A tape recorder for the career girl to dictate into. Or to blackmail your cheating husband. massage machine which knows a wrinkle or two, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And a quick flick of the wrist ensures that the curtains are properly closed. Mm-hmm. The designers of this 2,500 pound bed haven't missed a trick. A late night or early morning cup of tea is right beside you. Sorry, I can't hide my disgust. Milk first? That is an abomination before God. And if you just can't sleep, you can have a whale of a time pressing buttons all night. Oh, I'm sure there was plenty of button pushing after the camera stopped rolling. But the bed isn't just a place to sleep, relax and eat box, as some people have actually managed to turn the bed into art, and even politics. This is Tracy Emin's bed, first exhibited at the Tate Gallery in 1999, where it was shortlisted for the Turner Prize and eventually bought by famous art and domestic abuse connoisseur Charles Saatchi. It is the artist's real bed, in which she spent a four-day booze and misery session before getting up and deciding the whole thing belonged in a museum. And then I saw the bed out of that context of this tiny, tiny bedroom, and I saw it in just like a big white space. It belongs in a museum! It was an extremely controversial art piece, rapidly gaining notoriety in the popular press, drawing bulgy-eyed, gammon-faced criticism from the kind of people who think art is just paintings of big old ships and dead people in fluffy collars. Tracy Emin is in many ways the Piers Morgan of the art world, in that she has no inherent value herself, but it's just magic to watch her burst all the forehead veins of the kind of people who take art too seriously. In 1969, John Lennon and Yoko Ono staged their infamous bed-in protest against the Vietnam War, combining their twin passions of world peace and being as publicly insufferable as possible. John and Yoko believed that their protest would help put an end to military action in Vietnam, presumably by making America's military leaders roll their eyes so vigorously that they'd somehow rupture their fucking brain stems. It was named the Bed In in reference to the famous civil rights sit-in protests of the 50s and early 60s, in which black college students defiantly occupied whites-only establishments, bravely facing down police and racist institutions. Similarly, John and Yoko occupied a Hilton hotel room, bravely facing down the press and each other, which, to be fair, might have been worse. The Bed In was the most self-centred form of protest ever conceived, at least until the invention of slam poetry, and it was the worst thing to happen to 60s counterculture in 1969. And yes, I am including the Manson murders. Meanwhile, in the same year that John and Yoko shat the bed, a Californian named Charlie Hall was wetting it in a way that no one had before. Hall's waterbed was a quite remarkable innovation, a vinyl, water-filled, rectangular bladder with a temperature control device meant to synchronise with the human body. The waterbed arrived just in time for the Summer of Love, and as such sold well in certain small circles because of its sexually charged marketing. In the 1970s, though, the waterbed got a corporate makeover and was marketed as a luxury, shedding its image as a sloshy bag of stink where you'd be likely to catch a venereal disease. And this worked remarkably well. By 1986, one in five mattresses sold in America were of the waterpack variety, and this was despite their absorbent cost and the perpetual drowning nightmares they no doubt inspired. Experience a better night's sleep. <laughs> Since if you don't sleep on water, well, you certainly should. Country boy waterbed. Oh boy, night night. But the seasickness simulator had some fairly obvious drawbacks. For one, they were very heavy and had to be drained completely if you were to move them from room to room. They were also liable to be punctured, meaning it was the only bed in history that could actually piss itself. 
America woke from its wobbly fever dream in the 1990s, and as with other regrettable 80s fads like aerobics and freebasing crack, the waterbed is now only kept alive by a small subset of committed weirdos. So, what have we learned? If the history of beds has taught me anything, it's that sleeping in the past, for the most part, sounded like a fucking nightmare. I'm thankful for my modern bed, its luxurious thread count, and the fact that I don't have to share it with Yoko Ono. Ah! As is often the case, it is the things that we take for granted that we would be most devastated to lose. So when you're getting into bed tonight, or refusing to leave it tomorrow morning, be thankful that you were born now, in this brief, beautiful, cosmic window between the bedless days of old and the inevitable collapse of society and eventual heat death of the entire universe. Anyway, good night, and sleep tight, and don't let the brain-eating amoebas bite. This has been Ordinary Things. If you like what I've put out so far, please consider donating to my Patreon page and hit the bell so the next Ordinary Thing can be delivered straight to your face.